Well, I've continued flight testing my Bear Hawk aircraft over the last few weeks. I've been thoroughly enjoying it. And uh, on days whenever the weather is conducive to flight testing, I've been out there doing all sorts of things from stalling. Um, this week I tried uh, low weather configurations with slow flight and several stages of flap. And I experimented around with different flap settings to get the best visibility out of the front at a speed that was conducive to flying in bad weather. I've done a, quite a few flights now where, where I've loaded the aircraft up to an RFC of G and uh, much higher weight and I've played around with takeoffs and landings and stalls at those weights and at the CFGs and I've compared that to the Ford CFGs. We've made changes to the rigging on various occasions. We removed some of the reflex out of the ailerons um, and compared handling. We've changed the rigging a, a small amount on each flap and compared that. And overall I'm getting a very good feel for the aircraft now and it's flying much much better. I also added vortex generators, I've done quite a lot of testing with those. I don't have operational experience in any of these areas, but I have done a lot of flight testing and documented it all. So over the next couple of weeks I'm, I'm hoping to um, get my notes together and get the video clips together because I've videoed everything and um, put a, add a few videos to my YouTube channel in the, in the, help, um, in the hope that it might um, help a few others and also it's good for me to look back on and um, just see what I've done. So in this video I did quite extensive testing on the fuel system. There was a few things that I wanted to check out, a few things I'd heard and discussed on the forums and that's what today's video is all about. By the way, the clip that's playing currently, I went out this morning and allowed myself a flight into the mountains up one of the rivers and through a few mountain passes. It was a, a very calm morning, just spectacular day to be out in a bear hawk and I was having a lot of fun and I have done that on occasion throughout the testing as well. Anyway, on to testing the fuel system. When we're building our amateur built aircraft, we're pretty much free to design and build them as we like. Um, because mine was a quick build kit set, had already been designed and uh, prefabricated, I made every effort to stick uh, as close as possible to the designer specifications. The area that I'm talking about in today's video is the fuel system and the fuel system is very standardized having two high wing tanks. Uh, it's designed to gravity feed down to a gas escalator through the fuel selector and then to the engine. Now one area on my aircraft is because I've installed a fuel injected engine it does require an engine driven pump and therefore it also requires an auxiliary uh, pump which I've installed an electric pump under the uh, front floorboards. So what I wanted to do was go and give that a thorough testing just to see whether it was possible to unport one of the tank pickups with a low fuel in that tank that had been discussed at length on the forum and it did appear that perhaps one or two aircraft had experienced this so I wanted to put it to the test I took off and got a clearance up to 10,000 feet over the local airfield I spent two hours up there doing the testing and I ran off the left tank for the first 45 minutes until there was no fuel left in that left tank it didn't happen all at once what happened was once I got down to let's say five to eight liters the engine did start to surge and uh, you'll see that coming up here shortly. Inci incidentally, that monitor that I've got sitting up on the dashboard is a carbon monoxide monitor, and I'll discuss that later on in the video. You'll see now that uh, the engine's, uh, the, the left tank is starting to run very low on fuel, and the surging begins. tell by looking at the left tank sight gauge that it hadn't emptied completely. There was still a few litres of fuel showing in the sight gauge. So what I was doing initially uh, as the engine stopped running, I would select it uh, across to the right tank and wait for it to light up again. It, each time the engine was starting by itself with no assistance from me. I didn't need the starter motor, I didn't even need the fuel pump and it was only taking maybe five or six seconds to start up. On a few occasions I selected the both selector to ensure that it would restart on the both selector and once again it, it started with no problems there. However there was still some the small amount of fuel sloshing around in the left tank so as the uh, testing progressed what I was doing was reselecting the left tank and putting it out of balance so that the fuel was actually up against the fuel pickups. 
I was able to run it for quite a long time, maybe another uh, 10 minutes or so, maybe even 15 minutes in that situation. Every time I put it out of balance the opposite way, the engine would stop. So that was uh, completely expected. Every time it stopped, if I reselected the opposite tank or both tanks, it would restart. What I did next was to select the fuel selector to the both position, having fuel in the right tank and the left tank completely empty. So I selected the both position, the engine continued to run and I flew around for approximately 45 minutes uh, feeding off both tanks with the left tank completely empty and what I was trying to do was prove to myself that the engine would run satisfactorily with no stoppages. Uh, it didn't surge, it didn't stop at all um, after approximately 45 minutes. So then what I did next was I put the aircraft completely out of balance to the left side. I timed it for five minutes and I just flew along with it right out of balance like that. And then I put it out of balance to the right side and uh, repeated that exercise for another five minutes, still with no issues. Now bearing in mind at that stage, I probably had around 40 liters in the right tank with the left tank completely empty. So the final part of my test on the fuel system was to descend down to 2,000 feet. I applied full power on the engine and climbed through uh, several thousand feet with a pitch attitude of uh, varying between 10 and 15 degrees just to see if the fuel system could cope with an empty tank with the full demand uh, for the fuel flow. Once again it didn't surge and it didn't stop. So overall I'm fairly happy that uh, the fuel system is robust for what it's designed to do. Now there are a couple of things that I haven't tested and uh, those are things that I do have to keep in the back of my mind. The, the most obvious one is that when both tanks are low on fuel and you're flying in turbulence it may be possible to unport one of them even though you've got fuel in both tanks. The other situation is when one tank is empty and you're flying out of balance it may be possible uh, with low fuel in the remaining tank to unport that remaining tank. Obviously I didn't want to try that out, I, I'm fairly convinced that it will stop the engine and in order to protect against that happening my plan is just not to run the fuel down that low. I think 45 minutes reserves is probably a safe amount to be landing with on my aircraft. Now obviously I was only able to test the fuel system on my own aircraft as I built it. There are a couple of other configurations that I'd be very interested to hear test results for and one of those is where you have a much more powerful fuel pump. So once my electric pump is turned on it brings the fuel system pressure up to 32 psi and without it turned on it's between 22 and 25 psi. Uh, I believe that some fuel pumps can cause a or bring the system pressure up to around 80 psi. Also the other configuration that's very common on a lot of aircraft is when you have a fuel return line returning fuel back into one of the tanks. So those are things that obviously I wasn't able to test on on my aircraft. So one point of interest is that uh, obviously just before the engine stopped each time or surge there was a decrease in fuel flow pressure that I was able to observe by looking at the panel. Now that's not much good to me when I'm flying along because I may not be looking at that instrument specifically. So what I've done now, it, it happened each time the fuel pressure dropped below 20 psi it was accompanied by an engine surge or a complete stop. So what I've done now is I've lowered the red line. That's what I'm pointing to in this clip here. I'm actually watching the, uh, the fuel pressure decrease, then the fuel flow starts to decrease and then the engine stops. I've now set the red line to 20 psi, tested that, so I now get a warning and uh, that gives me about maybe 8 seconds, may maybe 8 to 10 seconds and you can quickly reach down and change tanks if, if you're uh, quick about it. So I mentioned earlier about the carbon monoxide that's sitting up on the dashboard there. And uh, I, I went and bought one because they're not particularly expensive. I paid 53 New Zealand dollars for it. It's, uh, I, I consider that to be very cheap as an insurance policy. Now the reason why I got it, you can also see I've got one of the uh, typical light aircraft carbon monoxide cards sitting uh, just up above the park brake or just to the right of the, of the mixture lever. So I've got that one there. I've also got another one now up on the right wing panel, uh, on the wing root panel that's out of view of the camera. The reason why I've got two is because um, I, I actually experienced some carbon monoxide coming into the cockpit. So 
Early on in the test flying, I probably had about 10 hours on the aircraft. Everything was going pretty well. And uh, I noticed on one flight that I was getting a dark spot on that card to the right of the mixture lever. So I came back and landed fairly promptly, aired the cockpit out, I didn't fly again that day. And I concluded that it was the carbon monoxide or the exhaust was probably entering at the top of the oleo struts and coming into the cabin that way. So I remade the strut covers, um, sealed them a whole lot better and uh, went flying again and noticed that the card was just normal. It didn't turn dark at all. But I did decide to put an extra card in and uh, from that point on I didn't get any change in the colour on the card so that was quite interesting. However on a further flight, several flights later, I did get a bit of a headache and I went back and landed straight away and uh, anyway didn't fly again that day either and continued flying the next day. The cards never changed colour again. I was mentioning this to a friend who's also an engineer and he had one of these uh, portable carbon monoxide monitors designed for an RV or a caravan and he loaned it to me. When I saw the price on them, I couldn't come up with any reason not to just go and buy one. So I bought one. I've you know, currently now I've got it mounted up on the um, permanently on the on the right wing root panel. So what actually happened was on the very first flight, I got airborne and almost within probably two or three minutes, I got a reading on the carbon monoxide digital monitor. Now the reading was uh, from memory around 50 or 60 parts per million, considered to be quite a low reading. Um, I think once you're up around 800 parts per million, uh, you've got a fairly limited uh, useful time left. You want to be on the ground and anything uh, up around sort of three, 400 parts per million, you need to be paying attention and, uh, and, and looking for an escape strategy and getting on the ground. 50 or 60 parts per million, um, according to everything uh, that I read in the instructions, you could fly most of the day like that, probably wouldn't give you a headache at all. So it was quite interesting to see that the cards weren't giving me any indication at all, and yet the digital monitor was. The next thing that I noticed was there was a, a huge change between running Rich of Peak and Lean of Peak. Rich of Peak uh, there's apparently the engine produces plenty of carbon monoxide. I was getting a reading. I, the highest reading I got the whole time was 200 parts per million. As soon as you go lean of peak within two minutes, which is about the lag time on the on the monitor, uh, lean of peak, it read zero the entire time. I never managed to get a reading on it when running lean of peak, and that's really good because I plan to run lean of peak um, once I've run the engine in uh, properly and once I finish the test flying. So it was quite an eye-opener to me that I had been flying around for a number of hours with these cards, uh, two of them in the cockpit, and I, you know, quite reassured that I was doing the right thing with regard to monitoring any carbon monoxide coming into the cockpit, and yet not really understanding that they weren't giving me the warning that I thought they would. So this digital monitor has been a bit of a game changer for me. As a result of that, we started um, troubleshooting and taping up areas just, just with normal tape to try and prevent um, any, any exhaust gas from coming in those areas. And we did it step by step one flight at a time, troubleshooting and trying to find out where it was coming on. I had, uh, where it was coming in. I had a pretty good idea that it was coming in through the gascalated drain hole, which was sitting between the exhaust pipes and slightly aft of them. So it was a fairly logical point for the carbon monoxide to be entering the cockpit. So we then taped over that hole, monitored the readings. There was still a small amount coming in that we never really traced down. I've sealed the firewall. I've sealed as many areas off as I can. Um, discussing this with other friends, I was surprised at the number of people who assured me that they were getting no carbon monoxide uh, coming into their aircraft. The, the interesting thing was that um, in nearly all those cases, people hadn't actually tested it. They were just using these cards. So yeah, I, I would say if you get a chance, um, go out and invest in one of these little monitors. To me, it's worth its weight in gold. So long story short, in order to solve the problem of this fuel drain hole, I was considering putting a flap over it, just a lockable flap. Um, what, what I've actually done is uh, the, the removable panel that sits around that area, I've, I've cut a gasket and, and now when it goes back on it fits in with a gasket 
and I've put a small gurney flap made out of angled aluminium just in front of the hole. The idea behind that is that it disturbs the airflow and uh, creates more of a suction out of the hole rather than forcing air into it. Once again, with a correspondingly um, with a corresponding decrease in the carbon monoxide levels. So now for the last few hours of flying, and it has been lean of peak, I've had a reading of zero the entire time. Well, that's all for this episode. I do plan to get another couple of episodes out over the next few weeks, one on the installation of Vortex generators and what I learned about those. Also what I've learned about the weight and balance distribution, the forward CFG versus the aft CFG limits, how they pertain to my aircraft in particular, and, uh, and the installation of the IO540 up front, the effect that that has on the weight and balance. Once again, thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned for the next episode.